Uh, we'll go to public session for a moment. We're now in public session. As we have a quorum, I call the meeting to order. Uh, colleagues, I remind you again about the mobile phones. If you have them, either flight mode or switch them off completely, or any other device that might interfere. In accordance with standard procedures agreed by the Committee on Procedure and Privileges for Paperless Committees, all documentation for the meeting has been circulated to members on the document database. I now propose we go to private session to deal with correspondence and other matters. Is that great? At the outset, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity, by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statements that you've submitted to the committee will be published uh, on the committee website after the meeting. And members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. And once again, colleagues, to remind you, if you have mobile phones, um, would you either switch them off or to flight mode? They both interfere with the meeting and the recording and broadcast of it. At this stage, I'd like to welcome uh, the National Treasury Management Agency, who's represented today by Mr. Conor uh, O'Kelly, CEO, and the Department of Finance, who are represented by Mr. Owen Dorgan and Mr. John Palmer. You're all very welcome. And as I say, your opening statements um, and submissions have been received and have been circulated. Um, so what I'll do is I'll ask you to make a summary first, both of you, uh, both organisations, and then uh, there will be a range of questions from the members of the committee. So maybe, Mr O'Kelly, if you'd like to commence, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to, to be here and hope I can be of, uh, of, 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 of some assistance. Um, maybe uh, rather than re reading my statement uh, again, uh, ju maybe just I thought, uh, Chairman, if it would be worthwhile giving an overview of um, the NTMA, how we're seeing the world through, through our lens, if you like, as uh, both a debt manager, and then move on to talk a little bit more detail about the Strategic Investment Fund, which is more uh, probably specifically relevant to, uh, to, your, to your work uh, here today. A couple of other areas of the NTMA do touch on the um, housing sector as well, and I'll just mention them in passing, and then obviously uh, take any questions that you have. So I suppose the, uh, the first thing is, is uh, as I said in my statement, the, you know, we all know the economic conditions are, 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 are very favourable in terms of uh, uh, economic growth and uh, all of the numbers around uh, Ireland's credit, uh, improving credit profile, and uh, that's been reflected in the upgrades from the rating agencies themselves. But even long before that, the, the investors in the bond market have re-rated Ireland very, very significantly over the last couple of years. And uh, a couple of years ago, we were very much a peripheral European country in terms of where we traded in the markets, in terms of our yield and our credit spread over Germany and other countries. And we've now moved into a more semi-core, uh, and we're now we're compared to Belgium and France rather than um, Spain, Italy, Greece, and, and those peripheral countries. And you know that reflects the, the, the improving economic uh, uh, conditions. So the credit of the country has improved very significantly due to that economic performance. And then the other factor, of course, is the interest rate environment uh, has been very favourable because of the policies being pursued by the ECB and uh, quantitative easing, etc., has meant that interest rates are, are extremely low. So that combination of, of low interest rates and uh, Ireland's improving credit rating has meant that um, the NTMA on the state's behalf has been able to access finance markets at very attractive rates and, in fact, uh, historically uh, low rates over the last um, 12 uh, to 18 months. And, you know, I suppose that, you know, that, that, that's great and that does help um, our interest bill in, 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 in particular, which has come down from around $7.5 billion to just below $7 billion. And, you know, our belief is that over the next few years that could trend towards uh, $6 billion would be our hope if the current interest rate environment remained, remained benign. It's worth pointing out that in 2012 um, the forecast for our interest bill annually w was $10 billion. And, and so I think that uh, the, 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 the quantitative easing and the interest rate environment has uh, significantly helped Ireland in terms of we've been a big beneficiary because, of course, we are still 
uh, quite an indebted country. And I suppose I just want to touch on that for, for a second because uh, although interest rates are very low and we can access markets at very attractive rates, uh, um, I just want to make the, the point that we, we do have quite a high level of absolute debt. So, so we talk a lot about our debt to GDP ratio and it's come down to 94% from 120%. And uh, you know that's really because of the economic growth figures that pushes that ratio down lower. The absolute level of debt at over 200 billion is four times what it was in 2007. And so our interest bill, which I've just said is close to 7 billion, was 2 billion in, in 2007. So our debt that we're carrying, you know, that's really the legacy of the crisis that we still carry with us. And, uh, when we talk about um, interest rates being attractive and maybe that the state should borrow more money, you know, it's, it's worth reflecting that we already, you know, have quite a lot of substantial borrowings. And, you know, in relation to how, how we look at the, at the market, if you like, and the things that we, that we think about every day, no, no more than any other borrower, a um, sovereign borrower really isn't, isn't any different. Uh, money that we borrow has to be repaid or it has to be refinanced when, when it comes due. So what, what do we think about? We think about probably three categories. Um, we think about revenue. So uh, what are our sources of revenue? Uh, what could happen to disturb or change those, those sources of revenue? Are we extrapolating unsustainable uh, uh, revenue in, in, in any case? And I suppose in Ireland's case, as a small open economy, we are quite vulnerable to external factors. We have had quite a bit of uh, tailwind in terms of low interest rates, low currency, uh, good growth in overseas markets, low oil price. And you know they can change and they can reverse, and we have to be, be cognizant of that. I suppose the second category we think about is um, repayment. You know, what are repayment dates, and how do they coincide with our revenue profile? And do we have enough flexibility? Do we have enough cash? Are we managing our short-term uh, uh, finances in a way that will allow us to do that? And you know, in terms of our repayment schedule for the next 18 months, our repayment schedule is quite light. But in 2018, 2019, and 2020. Uh, uh, 45 billion in, in borrowing will come due in that three year period, the majority of it actually in 2019 and 2020. So th that's the kind of thing in the NTMA that we're already trying to think about, work towards, and we, ha we have to think about that when we're, when we're in, the, in, the borrowing, in the borrowing markets. The last factor is the abs you know, our absolute debt position, so uh, you know, how much debt do we have, and I suppose who are we borrowing from, and that's a very important consideration. And uh, uh, in Ireland's case, we borrow from international markets. 90% of our traded debt is owned by international institutional investors. And uh, we don't have a very big domestic savings market in relation to our debt. So a country like Japan, for example, has much higher debt levels than, than Ireland and can sustain those because uh, uh, all of their um, borrowing can be uh, financed by domestic savings. And so the markets look on, on those kind of credits a little bit differently than they would on a country like Ireland that is dependent on foreign uh, 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 borrowers to, to that degree. So um, I suppose they're, they're, you know, they're the considerations for us and, and uh, um, you know, so we, we'd be reluctant to, to add to that uh, debt and I think uh, you know, uh, the Department of Finance uh, will, will talk a little bit more, more about the other restrictions which is around the expenditure benchmark, you know, even if we could borrow. So I think uh, what, what we're looking at is trying to, um, in terms of uh, uh, what Minister Noonan has asked the NTMA to focus on and prioritise in terms of housing and can we uh, uh, look at other parts of the NTMA that we can uh, uh, use to, to, uh, to free up and, and make some impact. So in that regard, the, the Strategic Investment Fund um, is, uh, is, 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 the, is, is the focus of, of the organisation. That's a 7.9 billion fund, as you're aware. 2.4 billion of that has already been uh, invested. Um, uh, right across the country. This afternoon, actually, we'll release the um, economic impact report from the Strategic Investment Fund, which has a breakdown of the regional uh, uh, investments there. About half of it is outside of Dublin, half of it in, in the Dublin area, uh, right across uh, uh, different sectors uh, of the economy. We have a pipeline of investors, about, of investments, about 50 uh, investments in the pipeline, probably, again, a value of close to uh, a billion in, in, in those, some very, very interesting projects having a very significant impact uh, about 18,000 jobs have been uh, uh, created by the, by the commitments that have been made to, the, to, to those businesses to date. In terms of what we can do in residential housing, what's currently going on, and then what we might be able to look at, uh, a number of uh, um, uh, investments already made in, 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 in some platforms that have been talked about, I know, in parliamentary questions, etc., that you've probably seen. So uh, there's a company called Activate, which is a 500 million fund. The uh, Strategic Investment Fund has invested 325 million, along with the uh, co-investor putting in the rest of the money. And that 500 million fund is kind of a non-bank platform that um, 
uh, provides um, all-in finance to uh, developers to, to build houses. So they, they, 90 per cent of the finance could be provided, um, 80 per cent, 70 per cent, up to 90 per cent. And as, as we all know, the banks are now in the business of maybe more like 50 or 60 per cent. So that gap in the market, that financing gap that uh, uh, developers are looking for, that is uh, what the, that fund has been created for. It's only been up about uh, up and running really five or six months, and uh, my up-to-date information this morning is that there's about 50 or 60 million of that has been drawn down, and that would be to build something like 800 houses, that, that, that kind of amount. Um, we've also invested in another vehicle called Ardstone, which is more of an equity vehicle, so that, that, that uh, uh, can buy um, uh, uh, land that is in the uh, later stages of the planning cycle, and then partner with developers to, um, uh, to, build, the, to, to, to build the houses. And that has been, um, has, has been active and has done its first transaction, and we're probably talking about um, 400 houses, something like that, in, in terms of being on the pad. Uh, another investment that, that, that we've made is uh, with DCU in student accommodation. I think the student accommodation sector is an interesting one because it is starting to move a little bit and that, of course, does release uh, houses that students are currently renting and freeze, freeze up the market. So I think it's an important sector. Um, so in DCU, uh, the, the ISIF has invested uh, 54 million in, in a fund uh, uh, to uh, uh, build student accommodation, 2,000 uh, units of student accommodation will be built by that. That money, that 54 million, actually released an additional 71 million from the EIB into DCU's overall campus development, uh, um, and so it was uh, had, 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 has had quite a significant impact for for for, for that university. Um, the final um, uh, smaller one is um, Urban Regeneration Fund, which we're looking to uh, build. There's been an uh, investment in Kilkenny, which some of you may know about, with Kilkenny Council as a regeneration um, investment, and we're looking to potentially set up a fund in conjunction with a domestic pension fund to uh, bring that out to other councils across the country in terms of the bigger um, uh, town, towns and cities. So I suppose there the, um, that's the current activity going on in, in, in relation to the ISAF. Um, our debt management team uh, also provide um, funds to the uh, HFA, to the Housing Finance Agency. So it's worth pointing out that we now uh, uh, borrow the money on their behalf since 2010. Uh, prior to that, they did it themselves. And uh, just to make the point that we, we borrow that money on the market at government rates and we, we don't charge any margin to the HFA, so that goes straight through. So they're accessing at the best rates possible at this point, uh, no margin, and then they obviously lend that on to uh, approved, uh, approved housing bodies. Um, the, I suppose the last smaller bit is the NDFA is involved in public-private par partnerships, and uh, you know, that's a channel that, you know, a long-term channel that we should keep, keep open and, and, and looking at, but it, 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 it does take quite a long time to, to come to fruition. They're, they're working on a PPP right now, which has got a um, uh, uh, set to build 1,500 social houses. The first bundle of 500 um, has been approved and is going through that process, but we're talking about 2019, 2020, before that public procurement uh, process gets completed and those houses can actually be ready for somebody to, to move into. So I think it's just something on the long term to keep a, a channel that we'd want, want to keep open. Um, so, the, 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 uh, the, as I said earlier, the, you know, the Minister has asked us to prioritise the sector and, and, and look across the uh, business as to whether we can come up with something else. So, so we're looking at a couple of um, uh, platforms. One is in relation to um, infrastructure, an infrastructure fund, to try and bridge this gap where infrastructure is clearly badly needed to release developments. And uh, you've seen the Dublin Housing uh, uh, Agency and Task Force uh, say that there's close to 50,000 uh, units could be built if, if, if infrastructure, um, bridges, roads, uh, water, sewage, etc., uh, could be uh, could be found. So uh, we're looking at um, establishing a fund that could lend money either to local authorities directly or to the private developers who would come to us, uh, and uh, and we would potentially look at. And wh why would that be different from what's available in the market? I suppose we could we could look at. 10, 20-year uh, time horizon, maybe even longer. We'd be prepared to take collateral against levies from the local authority from the, from, from the house as they're built in, in a way that other um, financial institutions wouldn't, wouldn't be prepared to do. So that flexibility, I suppose, and tenure of, of, of the investment might allow us to do things a bit different uh, from the rest of the marketplace. And we think that we can, uh, we, we can add some value there. So we're working quite hard on, on, on that, talking to local authorities and developers uh, right now in relation to that. I suppose the second possibility is um, to, uh, to look at a, 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 so, a social housing vehicle. 
where we could um, purchase social houses on behalf of uh, approved housing bodies who are either struggling to, to, to borrow the money or don't want to borrow or can't get access to the funds, that if they've identified houses that they want to buy, that we could set up a vehicle that um, we could buy them on, on their behalf using funds from the ICE of potentially private capital and obviously uh, the rental income, we enter into a lease then with the uh, AHBs for 20 years and that's an income producing vehicle, an asset and would be of course, crucially uh, off balance sheet, and I suppose that's the, the kind of final message. And sorry for going on so long. Um, the, uh, that I think um, is that you know we're trying to look at off balance sheet uh, uh, private capital uh, vehicles, and I think if you look at the commercial housing space, uh, and, or sorry, the commercial property space, you, you know you've seen that has um, uh, uh, come back to market a lot quicker than the residential space, and there's a lot of institutional capital and private capital has come into that space, and I think we need to find a way, if we're going to look five, ten years down the road, I think we'll have a residential uh, housing market that will have a lot more long-term institutional permanent vehicles to fund this and take the risk, because we don't want the banks uh, taking the risk, because the taxpayer ultimately, as we know, can bear, bears the brunt. We, we want to see shareholders who, who are dedicated to that business taking the risk and being able to go through the cycles uh, uh, with a bit more ease. Thank you, Mr O'Kelly. I know there will be a number of questions, and particularly in the off-balance sheet aspect of uh, funding. Uh, but before we do that, uh, Mr Dorgan, would you like to...? Yeah, I'll just speak very briefly. I thank the, uh, the committee for inviting the department to accompany the NTMA to this discussion on possible new housing uh, finance models. I'm joined by my colleague John Palmer from the budgetary policy section. Um, I'll just really briefly reiterate what Mr O'Kelly said in terms of the NTMA's views on the state's de debt levels. It's important that the, um, the state exercise caution in making addition in additional borrowings. You know, we already have a very high debt level. We're vulnerable to economic shocks, as the, uh, Mr O'Kelly has said, both internal and external. The, and you, the substantial reduction in our debt costs that we've seen has been attributable very much to uh, you know, meeting our targets and actually overachieving against our budgetary targets. Also, in terms the other factors, the ECB's monetary policy and just the strong growth model within the economy. Um, I suppose just to draw attention to the programme for government partnership, government has committed the government to meet in full the, the domestic and EU fiscal rules. And this commitment has been a reassurance to financial markets, as evidenced by the recent Moody's upgrading, which cited the government's adherence to those rules. Um, and as a department, we see the reality of any of a breach of the fiscal rules will have a negative impact on the state's borrowing costs, which will impinge on our ability to provide public services. Uh, again, in relation to the Irish strategic, Ireland Strategic Investment Fund, the programme for partnership government includes a number of commitments that would involve the ISIF, the first being working with the Irish banks, the European Investment Bank, industry bodies and the central bank to develop a new help to build funding scheme for development of affordable housing in the private sector and then secondly encouraging the delivery of housing related enabling infrastructure in large scale priority uh, development areas which I think Mr O'Kelly has already referred to. As well as from the department's point of view in order for the ISIF to accomplish its core objectives and the additional objectives which government may set for it, it has to operate in line with the stop its statutory mandate of uh, generating commercial return and also having an economic impact in terms of its investments. And that return ensures that both the principal and the return can be reinvested in the future. So it's a, it's a constantly cycling fund. Um, so therefore, I suppose, in relation to any housing sector investments that the ISF engages in, they have to be structured in, in a manner that generates a commercial return, so as to meet the legal uh, framework. And they also, that really keeps it off balance sheet, which is absolutely vital given the fiscal rules and also just the state's budgetary, uh, budgetary and debt position. Um, so I suppose we're, the department's committed to working with other bodies to examine all potential financial models, and we we'll look forward to assisting the committee in, the, in its work. So thank you very much. And just before I open it to questions, uh, you might just clarify, Mr O'Kelly, two or three more technical points, and, and they were specifically in relation to issues you mentioned. You talked about the possibility of funding uh, student accommodation in the likes of DCU. Um, 
you might tell me what progress is being made there, but, and also, is that deemed to be an off-balance sheet uh, investment? Secondly, you referred to, uh, which the committee is familiar with, uh, an infrastructure deficit in the greater Dublin, across the four local authorities, that would have the potential of assisting the development of up to 50,000 housing units. And you mentioned that a possible return on that investment could be from development levies or so forth. Again, in that context, is that being deemed an off-balance sheet type transaction? And finally, just for the benefit of the committee, you mentioned the Activate, um, and while it's a very new vehicle, you said commenced in January and whatever, um, there are ambitious plans for it, but do you at this stage have any, I, I suppose, uh, pathway year on year what the project projected uh, outturns might be. But if you could deal with those three technical points, and then I'd hand it over to the committee. Yeah, um, thank you. The, the first one in relation to student accommodation, I was more making a point about private capital in general coming into the sector, and that that's visible, um, you know, right across the, across the different university campuses, and they are they are seeing that, and they're all developing student accommodation plans, and there are, there are uh, there there is investment uh, coming into that sector in relation to DCU in particular. Um, yes, that is, that, is, that is off balance sheet, and uh, we're talking about 2,000 uh, student accommodation uh, uh, there. Um, in terms of the uh, 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 infrastructure fund, um, you know, again, again, in terms of, you know, and, and probably Owen is better qualified than I am in terms of what's off balance sheet and on balance sheet, and then of course you've got a separate uh, state aid pot uh, potential uh, rules to, to, to look at. But uh, I think that's where the commercial return uh, comes into it, and you have to be, uh, the market test has to be met in general. That's if you start to uh, offer uh, free money or money at uh, rates that aren't, are, are, are different from where the market is, that's where you get into trouble in terms of, in terms of state aid. And in terms of um, uh, off balance sheet, it's important that private investors and co-investors are, are coming in at the same time on the same rate. That's generally a, a key test for you to get there. So in terms of providing uh, the, the, the infrastructure fund, you can do it at a competitive rate, but, and we could be at the lowest rate possible to, to meet that uh, criteria, but it, it can't be zero, and it can't be probably 1%, but uh, I don't know, it could be 4%, it could, I guess it could be. Uh, but I suppose it, being more creative about the long-term tenure and the payback period is where really something like the Strategic Investment Fund can uh, take a view, um, uh, given its remit, that uh, other financial investors you know, uh, might not take. Uh, activate the, activate. Out, uh, the potential out, outturn. Really, I, 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 don't, I don't have a view. I mean, ultimately, their, their ambition, the original plan was that they could um, uh, 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 help build up to 8,000 to 10,000 houses over a five-year life cycle, and then that money would come back and the fund would be recycled and, and it would be a permanent non-bank vehicle that, would, that could finance that on, on that kind of a cycle basis. You know, however, you know, when it was set up, the, 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 the financial markets were a bit tighter, and I pro they probably expected that um, uh, uh, they were going to charge a, maybe a higher rate or there might be more demand uh, for, for their service because there wasn't other money available. But by their nature, by, set, by setting it up, and this is what happens, and this is what happened in the commercial property sector, I think the first REIT was Green REIT, which went onto the market and probably thought it was going to be the only available capital for a very long time, and yields on commercial properties were 8 9% and set to stay there, and there were going to be great returns for investors, but of course other capital does come in and follow. So I suppose for, for the Activate model, and it, you know, I'm not saying this because obviously we're, we're an investor in the fund and I, don't want to, I hope they're successful, but in, in the event of them uh, having to meet other competition, uh, that's probably from this committee's point of view, that's probably a good outcome uh, uh, because it'll mean more finance is becoming, uh, becoming available. So I think that's what's happening. You're starting to see the thing loosening up a, a, a little bit. We, are, we hope they're particularly successful this year and next year in particular, you know, because we need a catalyst in, in, the, in the market. I'll uh, open to the committee. Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Chairman, and welcome our guests as well, and uh, compliment them on their work over the years, because the NTMA have been known to, uh, to uh, invest wisely in such a way as to, to uh, achieve uh, reductions in debt. Uh, through to wise investment. I'm particularly uh, interested in the, the extent to which uh, you borrow money and lend on to uh, people like the uh, Housing Finance Agency, um, because we did have them as well before us recently, and I seem to recall that they, their interest rate was a bit higher uh, on, on lending on, but I might be wrong about that, but just uh, to, to, be sure, to be sure, the question that I raise again is, to what extent can you be assured that the bodies to which you lend on, um, having borrowed at a very competitive rate, uh, do not 
uh, take a handing fee off the top of it uh, any more than you do? And that's one question. Uh, the other question is, um, as, as you know, Chairman, I'm not a great uh, supporter of housing bodies, and I've, I've, I, I got the information coming through there again that housing bodies are an, an option for, for meeting. Uh, the housing bodies failed. That option failed. It, that's one of the reasons that we have the problems we have in, in, a, in, in a deficit in local authority housing, because it was a shift from uh, dependence on the local authorities to the private sector, and it didn't work. So my, my question there is this. To what extent can you <clears throat> enter into arrangement with the local authorities uh, uh, in order to lend money to them directly or indirectly by way of co housing cooperative or by way of association with other bodies in such a way as to make the maximum amount of money available and at the same time uh, keep, keep within uh, the off-balance sheet requirements? And the other one is, is um, the procurement difficulties. What procurement difficulties uh, do you see as being obstructing uh, the progress of, of, of what you are interested in, in doing, which we appreciate, uh, because of the necessity to make rapid progress in relation to the immediate and urgent situation of homelessness and impending homelessness arising from the issues that, that we read about every day. I have two or three more questions there, Chairman, if you would bear with me just for a moment. Given that, that, that interest rates internationally are at an all-time low, there's always a tendency for people to invest, people to invest in areas that produce a greater return. Uh, which in turn competes with the building of houses and money available for the building of houses. To what extent are you conscious of that and, and to what extent can you take steps to ensure that the vital, the vital requirement of funding and availability funding for the building of houses now is, is, is sacrosanct and ring-fenced to, to a huge extent. And the, I, I, the last point is in relation to universities. Uh, I live in Maynooth and, and uh, the university there has a huge uh, uh, development programme, which I presume is being, is being considered in the context of, uh, of uh, the required student accommodation. Uh, um, and funding uh, for, for same that, that was mentioned to us last week as well, Mr. Chairman. So, and the last question is, is this: I note you have told us to dampen our, our, our expectations uh, about the debt accumulation as time goes by. We know we know about that. It will also reduce as time goes by, and particularly relative to economic growth. And that's what has been the internationally accepted norm that, and, and expectation. Uh, I use, can, can you give the, 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 the committee any indication uh, or assurance to the effect that our rate of economic growth now and for the foreseeable future, if prudent policies are, are, are followed, uh, in order to try to, to reassure uh, our, our, our constituents, the people of, of the country, who made huge sacrifices in order to bail out the financial institutions and are anxious to see some recognition of their efforts, like, for instance, in the way some financial institutions are progressing to make many people homeless in the present time, which I believe is, is a, 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 an issue that will have an impact on the work of the NTMA and, in fact, the work of this committee, obviously. Thank you, Deputy. I'm going to take the answers as we go along. Just to clarify one or two points, Deputy Durkin. Uh, the issue of procurement might be more directed towards the Minister and that department as well as what's here today and to yeah, let, you, yeah. know, let yeah. you know there yeah, yeah. later in the week. And just to, to support the issue you, you may, mentioned about the Housing Finance Agency, and I quote from their submission, based on current rate, rates, it's expected that the Housing Finance Agency will be able to offer rates at less than 1.75% fixed for 25 years to local authorities for development finance. That's quoting from their recent report. And that, I think that was the figure you were looking for. Thank Gentlemen. Sure. I'll just ask about how we proceed. Just a, a query. There's two very different organisations, you know, with two different issues. Is it possible to ask questions to one and then to another? It's just, when you're directing, I have specific ones on the NTMA, but also But ask the two sets and they'll both, they'll both answer their questions. So All together? Yeah, individually. But when it's your turn, direct the question if you want to either person and they'll answer. Both will answer one after the other for you. Okay. It's okay. just, there's really two separate sessions but really. But some, issues, this, some issues over cross and that's why, you know, <coughs> members weren't, weren't directly sure who would have responsibility. So you have both witnesses. Direct your question to one or both. Right, I have a good few questions. Okay. Well, we'll get to you in due course. Uh, in reply to Deputy Durkin. 
Um, okay, Jeffy, I'll try and, re try and uh, uh, re re recall those questions in, in, in order. I mean, the, the HFA, you've, you've, you've clarified that, Chairman. It's, uh, you know, they, they, we don't have any um, remit in terms of how, how they lend that on and what margins they charge. I mean, the, the, uh, at the HFA is, a, I think, the Department of Environment or is it? Department of Housing. So, uh, so no, but I think I think we are um, we are keen, and we have and we have tried to do this as much as possible. Where the state is borrowing through any of its um, uh, uh, agencies, that we centralise all of that in the NTMA, and that's been a body of work that we've been working with the Department of Finance to do because that makes sense for uh, for, for for everybody borrowing centrally because that's where we can achieve the uh, the lowest rates. I mean, how how that money is used then out through the system is a matter for each uh, each each separate department. Um, you asked about the universities. I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, uh, you know, minute as possible is is part of that. I mean, the, the availability of institutional finance now for student accommodation is uh, is quite widespread. And it, please have them come and, uh, and and see me and see the strategic investment fund if uh, if you thought that was appropriate. Um, in terms of uh, the debt, will reduce uh, um, uh, 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 over time and. Uh, 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 economic growth uh, uh, will remain. I mean, our, our, we're, we're going to return to some sort of long-term potential growth rate, and I know the department will have a view of that. Maybe I'll pass that question to them because uh, they ultimately, that's where the, dis the, the, the discussion with Europe ten tends to be about our interpretation of what is the long-term potential growth rate for Ireland versus theirs, and the debate is somewhere between 2% and 4%. That has obviously a big impact in terms of uh, 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 the forecast. But Deputy, just to point out that the absolute level of debt will only go down if we uh, repay it. It only goes down as a percentage of our, of our, uh, of our GDP. In unless, you, unless you reinvest or sell uh, a loan, uh, such as the lending institutions are doing at the present time. In the past, Chairman, just by way of explanation, the NTMA have disposed of loans or reinvested or relocated their loans with a resultant uh, benefit to the Exchequer. Are you refinancing yes. the, the IMF, yes, for example? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. No, no, that would, that's, um, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very significant issue. And uh, you'll recall in 2015, the, the, uh, we refinanced 18 billion of IMF loans um, uh, uh, and refinanced those in the market, and the saving was very significant, uh, somewhere between one and a half uh, a billion to, to, to two billion over the lifetime of those loans. Uh, cri critically, that the maturity, those loans were maturing in four to five years' time. Uh, cognizant of the dates that I gave you earlier for other, other maturities, but we were able to replace those with maturities, maturities much longer, uh, 19 or 20 years, actually average of 19 years in total. So that was quite a significant prof improvement in the profiling of the debt and, of course, the interest that we have to pay. Unfortunately, in terms of that debt that we took on uh, um, from the, uh, the official debt, as we call it, there, the rates that we're paying on that are uh, very close to the current market level. There, there's very little room to refinance any uh, other existing debt that would that would give any material savings. Were rates to go even lower than they are now, some of those could come into play as being attractive to, to refinance. But unfortunately, the the expensive debt in terms of our interest costs that has all been uh, been, been been refinanced already. But maybe I'll ask uh, um, the department to talk about the growth rates. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, I just come back to your local authority question, I suppose. The first instance, it's a matter for the Minister for Housing in terms of setting a, a, the local authority's role in delivery, but I suppose we'd make the point that local authorities are within general government expenditure, so what they spend. Now, that doesn't exclude them if they structure it in a certain manner it potentially could go off balance sheet. And I think the key point we were trying to make in our initial presentation is if there's a commercial return within the venture is, an, is one way that it could potentially go off balance sheet. I think you also mentioned just the fund, availability of funding for housing. I suppose in terms of if the development of housing, I suppose what we're thinking is we need to have a mix of sources. Very much private sector has to be to get the scale required, you have to get the private sector involved. So the ISAF measures have been very positive in that sense. You're actually now starting to see completely private sector uh, care and a number of other issuances. Um, on the growth rate, John, do you want to reckon? Um, well, just as regards the, uh, the stability program update at the end of April, the, the department's forecast, which was endorsed by the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, was that real GDP, so real growth, uh, would be 4.9 per cent in this year, 2016, and then trending down uh, as we move out towards to 2020, down towards the 3% mark. Um, nominal GDP, which is when you 
put on the effects of the, the GDP deflation, the price effects. Um, that's expected to be around 7.6% this year um, and trending down to just over 4% in uh, 2021. And the nominal is very important because it's the nominal uh, growth in GDP is what gives us the denominator for the calculation of the debt to GDP ratio. Thank you. Deputy O'Brien. Thanks, Chair, and thank you for the presentations. Just a comment and then a few questions, and I suppose the comment is just to put the questions in context. One of the, the things that many of us in this committee are trying to find a, a solution to is, on the one hand, we have a huge and growing housing need, particularly for families uh, at the lower end of the income spectrum. At the same time, local authorities have been starved of resources, whether capital uh, or, or the ability to borrow to provide those houses. The private sector is telling us either it can't or it won't build for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, and at the same time, it is cheaper to build and to buy uh, and uh, private finance is, is cheaper for whoever is borrowing. So we're trying to find ways of getting the finance that's there into the organisations who are best placed to build those houses, which in our view, or the view of many of us, are local authorities uh, and to a certain extent uh, approved housing bodies, to provide the units, but on a scale far in excess of what has been discussed up till now by government. That's one of the discussions we've had. So I suppose with that in mind, my, my question is as follows. First, there are two general issues, and there are questions to both the Department and, and the NTMA in terms of the, 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 the borrowing restrictions, and, uh, and I'm saying this noting very clearly your caution in terms of additional borrowing, so I suppose I'm seeing if there's a way of answering this in that context. On the one hand, our debt-to-GDP ratio is declining as a result of growth in the economy, although the absolute level of debt is obviously clearly very, very large. But is there within the fiscal rules and particularly the debt reduction rules uh, that are required, is there a kind of a debt space, to coin a phrase, between the reduction as a percentage of GDP uh, and what we're required uh, under the fiscal rules that gives the government some additional borrowing room, which clearly you would advise the government not to take up because of the absolute level of debt, but which they could take up uh, and still remain within the fiscal rules? And if so, on the basis of the government's projections, could you maybe map that out for a couple of years? The second thing is, and maybe Owen, this is more a question for yourself, I don't fully understand the inter interaction between uh, the debt reduction requirements under the fiscal treaty and, and the EU regulations and the expenditure benchmark, so that even if there was some additional borrowing room within the EU fiscal rules, how would that then impact on the expenditure benchmark as it's set out? And if you could try and explain that, because what some of us are looking for is, is there, is there additional room either in borrowing or spending that could be directed either on or off balance sheet for the provision of social housing by local authorities? So that's the, the first question. The second question is, in terms of the NDFA and the PPPs, do, do, do the NDMA know why we're talking about 2019, 2020 before commencement of those? And if so, maybe could you explain those? Because I thought it was earlier. Um, on ter in terms of the off balance sheet stuff, are you talking about NARPs or an expanded role for NARPs, or are you talking about some other vehicle? And if you're talking about NARPs, my understanding is in terms of the houses that the approved housing bodies are currently leasing through NARPs, those properties won't, at the end of the lease term, uh, be the property of the approved housing bodies. They'll be the property of either a NARPs or the original owner. If you could just clarify that and tell me, would it be possible to use that vehicle but have a lease to buy option so that if the lease is over 25 years, the asset at the end then transfers over to whether it's a local authority leasing to buy or the approved housing body. Two final questions, uh, Chair. The first is we had the Irish League of Credit Unions in discussing obviously their um, proposal